What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Second Cup. Where you can get your second cup. Yes. <laughs> Cha-choom-choom. Choom. Inspirational. <laughs> um, I am so excited about today. I have been geeking out about this. I have gone on more rants about this guy in the past, how many months? Since the Four Olympics? months. Four months. Than probably any other athlete at the Olympics. Yeah. It is Steven Nedarazic. Yeah, Sean doesn't fangirl about really anybody, but we have been looking forward to this interview for so long, and she's just tickled at the impact that Steven has had on men's gymnastics, really on the cultural conversation, on who we're lifting up and idolizing yes. as, a, as a culture. Yes. And uh, so we had a fantastic conversation. We talked about Olympics. We talked about Dancing with the Stars. We talked about his background and upbringing, what his interests are. I love the conversation. Every, every second of it. And I feel like he has so much wisdom. So much. So much so that I want to sit my kids down and say, you have to watch this interview every year for the rest of your life. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> he is awesome. Steven, thank you so much for taking your time. Are right, taking time out of your day. Also, if you guys are watching Dancing with the Stars, please check it out. Go vote for Steven. Yeah. It's getting close to the end. And if you want to find out more about Steven, see his pommel horse routine. He's known as the pommel horse guy. Yeah. Uh, and he just has an incredible story. We'll link his information down below. But hope you enjoy this one with Steven Nedorazic. Steven, welcome. I am so excited to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to be here. This is really, it's going to be fun. Sean doesn't geek out about uh, anybody, really, but she has been so excited to speak with you. So we're just grateful you gave us the time, and you're you are just sweeping the nation. You're a huge deal, dude. Congrats! <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't think I'm a, a huge deal, but I'm glad that I can, you know, make Sean happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I could literally go on a tangent for so long, but Stephen, I don't know if you have realized what you have done single handedly for not just men's gymnastics, but young kids and just the entire social, I don't know, acceptance of what an icon looks like. Does it feel like you've <laughs> yeah. done this? It definitely doesn't feel like I've done a whole lot, but I, I've seen like the DMs where like parents are reaching out and they're like, hey, I want to let you know, like my son has coloboma and he's interested in doing sports, but was turned away from it. But then he saw you and now he's going to go after it. So I love to hear all those stories and I love that like, you know, kids look up to me and I can kind of be a role model for them. Going back to Paris where you dominated and you became a household name across the <laughs> world. Um, walk us through, when was the first time during Paris you realized you were a trending sensation? <laughs> it's really funny because like I had no idea for a while. So I like landed my you know, viral pommel horse routine, celebrated my team, got that bronze medal. It was like the best moment of my life. And then I had to go and do like an hour of media. And then I had to go get a drug test. So it took like three hours. <laughs> and the whole time I didn't have my phone on me. So I had no idea what was going on. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm missing dinner at my family. Um, so after I got drug tested, I walked to like the restaurant, only had about 15 minutes to eat food. And like, I sit down, I'm like trying to stuff my face because I'm like starving. Um, and then like my girlfriend Tess, she's like, Steve, like, have you looked at your phone yet? And I'm like, no. And she's like, you have to open your phone up right now. Like you were trending on Twitter. And I was like, what the heck? <laughs> and like opened my phone up and it was just like going crazy. And I was like, what is happening in my life right now? So yeah, that mm. was a very surreal moment. <laughs> I, I want to paint a picture for people who are listening who might not understand and this might sound a little bit brutal but Steven you can you can help me here the world hasn't you know men's gymnastics is phenomenal I have watched every men's gymnastics Olympics since back when I was interested in gymnastics but to have the world's attention on men's gymnastics is rare if not for every four years you single-handedly broke that barrier you became the pommel <laughs> horse guy and you had the entire world watching men's gymnastics. What yeah. What did your teammates have to say? <laughs> what did the teammates have to say? Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, like, they're, they're flabbergasted that I somehow blew up. And, and like, they kind of saw it coming because, like, I was the last guy up in that, on that uh, team finals day. I was the last guy up. I was only doing one event. 
And there's this fun countdown thing going on too throughout the competition for me to compete. Um, I mean, the guys are just so happy for me. And, and at the same time, they're so happy to hear all these stories of kids entering into the sport and like seeing people dressed up as pommel horses for Halloween. It's just like, I mean, it's fantastic to have like this much vision on men's gymnastics because it is a sport that like basically like people haven't even heard of men's gymnastics, like a lot of people. Um, so it's like amazing to know that because of what me and my team did over uh, the summer at, at Paris, like people are looking and like interested in the sport and putting their kids in it. And like more than anything, I am so excited to see what impact like our journey at the Olympics has on like the sport in general coming up in this like NCAA year when like it's going to be streamed and people can find a team that they resonate with and like really buy into the sport. So like I'm hoping that whatever I've done and whatever my teammates have done are going to help to continue to grow the sport in the country. Have you, would you say that your story has mostly been an underdog story or have you always been like the chosen one? (laughs) Which, which resonates more? I'm definitely more of an underdog story. (laughs) Um, Actually like definitely like as a single event specialist, it is very rare to have any opportunity on the USA national team. Um, so I was essentially the first specialist to make the national team back in uh, 2018, 2019. Back in 2019, when I first made my national team debut. Um, and then like from there, I just kind of kept pushing that boundary. Like I made it to world championships. I won the first gold medal on pommel horse for the USA. Um, and then the next year I, I made a world team as a specialist, which was essentially unheard of. People uh, were very turned away from that idea of having someone on a, a team that only does one event. Um, and it, didn't, it did not go well when I was at that world team uh, competition. I, I had a pretty bad competition. So then everyone was like, okay, so he's definitely not making the Olympics. And like from that moment when I messed up at 2022 world championships, like that's when I was like, all right, dude, like it's time to like lock in, like people are saying you can't do it. Like, let's prove them wrong. So yeah, I, I kind of resonate with that underdog story. <laughs> wow. I'm so curious your operating system, Stephen, because you have, uh, you have like this delightful, like you're not taking life too serious. You're up there having a blast in this high pressure moment. You're out there doing dancing with the stars, by the way, so smooth, dude, you're so smooth <laughs> on the you. dance floor, but then you have, uh, you know, you study electromechanical engineering, which is very kind of logistical, like mathematical organized thing. You, you do this Rubik's cube in under nine <laughs> seconds, which is absurd. What is, what is like your approach to life? What's your philosophy on, on how you kind of maneuver through things? Yeah. I mean, I love a puzzle and I think that gymnastics itself is a puzzle. Like every turn that I take, in gymnastics, I'm recording it, I'm analyzing it, and then I'm making changes. And like, that's kind of just like how I go through life. Like I I find a puzzle that I want to solve, and I solve it. Um, So like, of course, as the electrical engineer that I am, I love puzzle solving, the Rubik's Cube guy that started when I was 12 years old, you know, every every aspect of my life is kind of like a puzzle that I'm trying to solve. And like, I think that uh, in general, like I do take life a little lightheartedly, I, I take things one day at a time. And whatever pressure may come along with it, I face it head on. Um, I I think just in general, I'm kind of just a normal dude who just is a little bit of a geek and (laughs) found himself as an elite athlete. (laughs) Mm. You use the term geek, but I think the world has called you Clark Kent. So I think there's, it's a good thing. It's Um, definitely a good thing. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Going into Paris, I feel like I'd be curious since you are very smart in your logistical and analytical and you you have your strategy in place i would guess this outcome not the metal outcome but the attention side of it was different than expected how has this changed your trajectory your journey afterwards having now all of this spotlight all of this attention being on dancing with the stars and all these opportunities yeah, I mean, it is unbelievable. Like, I, I, I was telling uh, Tess, my girlfriend, like, yesterday, I was like, it seems like every week I'm doing something that is so amazing, like an opportunity that comes up that is just so amazing that it could be, like, the talking point of the month or even, like, the year. Like, it, it's just, it's amazing. And, like, I could have never have calculated <laughs> with my logical reasoning that um, 
you know, how amazing after the Olympics was going to be for me, like, especially like dancing with the stars, I was terrified of joining, but like, I knew it was an opportunity that I couldn't turn down because of that reason. As someone who's never danced before, like, what can I do if I just put my full mind towards something and just try my hardest? And I've impressed myself with dancing with the stars. And then we have all these like really fun opportunities that come up um, that like, I, I just can't turn them down because of how amazing they all sound. And like, I know that, um, you know, when I finally do get a little bit of time off in the near future, I'm going to be able to like sit down and just like reflect on what this year has been and how amazing, you know, everything is going in my life. And I just love it. <laughs> wow. Has it changed your expectations or goals in life? Like what, what, what were your five and 10 year goals at the beginning of 2024 and what are they now? Yeah. So they are kind of similar. Like I always wanted to continue the sport after 2024, but like I thought for sure at this point of the year, I would be kind of chilling and like not doing a whole lot. <laughs> like I thought that like these few months, you know, leading up until like December, we're going to be so chill and I'd be able to just like, you know, play around <laughs> in the gym, just like hang out and really reflect on the Olympics. And man, did that not happen? I mean, and it's such a good thing it didn't happen because I'm loving every day of my life right now. But, um, it is funny because I'm a lot busier than I ever could have anticipated. Um, and, and, uh, in general, like those five to 10 year plans, it's going to be like, I'm going to continue the sport until my body falls apart until I can't do it anymore. And after that, I'm going to be an electrical engineer. So <laughs> pretty simple plans. <laughs> wow. Simple, but yet incredible. You just said you're going to be an electrical engineer. I Which can't is... wait for that day either. I love I love being an electrical engineer. It's going to be so Why? fun to finally sit down and build stuff. <laughs> Amazing. What's your dream job in that in that field? So I don't necessarily have a dream job yet. I have like dream places I'd want to be like, you know, being in like Silicon Valley working basically for anyone would be a dream come true as an electrical engineer. But like in general, I just want to find something like that resonates with me, maybe just like with my beliefs or like working on something that I think would help people like, I don't know, like solar panels or something cool like that would be really fun to dive into. Now I am just an electrical engineer with uh, you know, a four year degree that's four years old at this point and untouched. <laughs> so I can't really talk like I'm an amazing engineer or even smart, but I, I do want to make sure that I use my engineering background for something that I think would help people. Well, little piece of advice, Stephen, use your platform now and scream it from the mountain type mountaintops exactly where you want to go because <laughs> again, you have the world's attention. So I'm sure anybody in Silicon Valley would be lucky to have you. <laughs> oh, that's sweet um, of you. <laughs> Steven, do you do, I know you're busy, but do you dig in and do a lot of learning in your free time these days? Um, funny enough, like I don't like do like academic learning. Like I don't go and look at research papers or anything like that, but like you know, I do find it fun to like watch certain YouTubers, like three blue, one brown, an amazing like math YouTuber just has like these amazing videos that like you can learn a lot of. And he starts them from like, you know, the very ground base and builds it up for you. So like you kind of go on this like academic adventure. And like there are other YouTubers like that too that I watch. So I do very much enjoy like learning math or like physics or just like, chemistry, like just like on my free time, like I find that entertaining in general. What, uh, so math is a current interest. What, what would be some other, uh, current interests of yours? Yeah. So like, um, like, uh, like in general or like, what do I watch? Yeah. What, what like, what are you digging into right now? <laughs> I've been watching a lot of like, uh, these like chemistry videos, like every night. Okay. It's kind of what I've been watching before I go to bed. Just like what random channel? stuff. Like let's clean this sodium oxide <laughs> thing and i'm like okay let's watch that and like yeah. it, it's just like there's something satisfying about watching them like take these beakers and like these tubes and like explaining what's happening and like showing what chemical reactions going on and i'm like i don't understand any of it but i find it so cool and entertaining <laughs> yeah it's so fun we have uh you're into robotics a bit aren't you yeah definitely so our, our uh our two kids we have a five-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son and oh nice uh, I'm trying to, we try to do daily science experiments. The most recent one was a solar powered robot that you could like Sweet. put on a bow or you could put like legs, depending on how you build it, it could do different functions, but it's pretty interesting. Um, and you just said you had the, the interest in, in solar panel, but just the, 
the practice of like uh, uh, building that skill set from an early age is is really fun. We'll also try to watch some fun. Yeah, YouTube is such an incredible resource. You're like, wow, this is insane. Yeah, but, no, uh, YouTube yeah. is insane, and it's so cool to hear that like you're getting your kids into like robotics and like you know scientific stuff. I remember when I was a kid, uh, I think I was like eight years old. Like I took apart a toy truck of mine, and yeah. for like my school project, I literally just had the motor and the wheels and I made a robot. I just flipped the battery around and make it go backwards and forwards. But like, that yeah. was so cool to me. So like, it's really cool yeah. that you're sort of like giving your kids the opportunity to like discover science. Yeah. It's been a blast. You have a twin, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> are are y'all similar or, or, or different? I think when it comes to siblings in general, there's always going to be like that 90% overlap of like similarities. Like you just grew up in the same environment. You guys are kind of the same people, but then like that 10% that like is left over is so different. So like my sister, she's, you know, a very, very smart individual. She went to a fantastic school, Holy Cross. She got two degrees, one uh, in mathematics and one in theater, which are very Mm. different degrees to get. (laughs) Um, But she's currently a teacher. And I mean, yeah, we have a whole lot of similarities. I was going to say difference, but also very similar. You meddled on the pommel horse, but you're an electrical engineer. It's the same thing. <laughs> who's Math, just, who's yeah. just a beast See, on the That alone is a too. perfect way of looking at that. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. I haven't even thought of it that way. Yeah. I was going to say, finding yourself on Dancing with the Stars, how has that experience been for you? Oh, my God. I mean, being on Dancing with the Stars has been amazing. Like, every person that is involved in the show, whether it's makeup, costume, production, they are like a family. They are so sweet and kind. Like it, it's amazing. Um, but like getting onto the show itself, I was so nervous because I literally have never danced. Like not even like with my friends at a club or anything. Like I just don't do it. So like when I got invited to be a part of you know this amazing show, um, all my friends were like, "Dude, are you sure you want to do that? Like I have never seen you dance. Like you can't dance." And I was like, "You're right, I can't." So like at least I'll be able to be the person that like you know, other people can look at that have never danced and be like, okay, let's see how this goes. If you actually put the work in, how good can you get at dance if you've never done it before? And I've just loved this journey. It has been amazing. And it, it really kind of brings me back to like those early days in gymnastics where you're learning like the basic steps on each event, but like I'm doing it on the dance floor. And like, there's this sort of fun thing that happens every week where like you go through like this learning curve. And by that Tuesday that when it finally comes around to like the competition, you know, it's really just like, um, what's the word? It's really um, fulfilling to like be able to do it and like see how much you improved over a week. So I'm curious. I just had to learn my first dance. It was the most humiliating thing. (laughs) Like I always come in with way more confidence than I deserve to have. (laughs) And and then I underperform. But with dancing, it was like, how do you learn the dances? Cause for me, I have no framework or understanding of like what the process, I can't see the big picture, you know, like I can with other things just cause it's so new. So I had someone teaching me and I was literally just trying to memorize every single move in the right pattern. How are, how are you going about learning these dancing dances? Yeah. So like, you're kind of spot on with like my learning philosophy anyways, like step one for me is like, let's learn the steps. Let's just make sure that we know what we're doing with our feet. And then you kind of just like add on different layers is the way I look at it. So like first it's like, let's get the steps right. And now let's start to get the music and then let's start to get the form of everything and like refine, refine. And by like the time that like a week goes by and you've put in 20 hours of work into the dance, it Mm. looks pretty good. So like, I think like in general, especially with dance, it's such like a, um, there's something vulnerable about it because it is hard. And like, you look so silly if you're doing it wrong. Like you kind of just have to take that ego hit and just be like, okay, I'm going to look really dumb for a couple days here, but it's going to be worth it in the end when like I can look at the finished product and see where I started. <laughs> yeah, it, well, it's nuts because cause it's one thing to just like learn the steps and then it's another thing to do it with a little bit of style. And it's another mm-hmm. thing to like have <laughs> when I was learning my dance, I, my face the whole time was so like locked up or like concentrated. <laughs> and then you look at the pros do it and they're smiling the whole time. Yeah, and they so look like they're just go. having fun, but like, you know that there's a million things that they're like calculating Crazy. in their head. The face it's part so of it, impressive. I have to say the hardest. And it's so hard <laughs> to like have moments in your dance where like you're smiling or like you look at a camera that is yeah. incredibly difficult. It's always the last layer I throw on. <laughs> yeah. Which has been more nerve-wracking? Was it stepping onto the floor in Paris or stepping onto the dance floor in L.A.? 
<laughs> they were both nerve wracking for very different reasons. Uh, obviously, I have to choose my lifetime goal of being Olympian as <laughs> probably the one that's a lot more nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. But there is something that is just so different about dance. And like, it was like a whole new world for me to jump into. And like, just like that, like, I'd say like the Olympics, the, the hour leading up to my event was like the most stressful time of my entire life. But like with dance, it's been like, you know, when I first started that first three week period, it was like I had that same level of stress stretched out over three weeks because mm. it was like a whole new world of not only dance, but like being in LA and talking with producers and wearing a mic all day. And like, it was just like a crazy adventure. <laughs> yeah, I guess maybe the, the nerves from the Olympics was just because you've worked for it for decades and the nerves yeah. from dancing was because it was like a, a totally foreign exercise for you. And it's like, and that's exactly what it is. You're a hundred percent right. That's exactly yeah. what I felt. Yeah. I'm curious with all of the limelight that you have, how that has affected you and Tess's relationship. Oh, we're doing fantastic. Uh, luckily for me, Tess works remotely, so she was able to fly out and live here with L uh, in LA with me for this amazing experience. Uh, we were also able to bring our kitty, Kushu. Um, he was wrestling ra around earlier. I'm sure you guys might have heard him. Um, but, you know, we pretty much just took our normal life and brought it to LA. And although I might be busy for six hours, 10 hours a day, <laughs> whatever happens, like, you know, we're still us. We still have our relationship and we make everything work. Do you feel like you're prepared to have life maybe never be not this busy again? <laughs> I have a feeling it will calm down eventually, but if it doesn't, it's a blessing, right? And like it's uh, a privilege to be as busy as I am right now doing all these amazing things. So, you know, whatever comes my way, I'm just going to keep my chin up high and go after it full force. But um, yeah, you know, I'd be totally cool if my life stayed this busy. Yeah. I'm curious, going back to the little boy who fell in love with gymnastics way back when, now being in the position you're in, what would you tell this generation of kids who are going, whether it's towards science or going into school or a new sport, what is what is the, the message you'd have for them? I mean, in general, just like find what you want to do and go after it. Like don't make excuses for yourself. Just like find something simple. For me, when I was growing up, like, I wanted to be able to do like a hard skill on palm horse. It was called a flop. And it probably took me three years to be able to actually do it. But like I put in extra work every single day to be able to do it. And um, I think in general, like growing up, especially you are so much smarter than you think you are. Like kids, they have the malleability of their brain. They can really learn things so much better than anyone else. Like if you as a child wants to learn a Rubik's cube, you could do that in a week. You could learn how to do a Rubik's cube in a, in a week easily. And I just think like for any kid that's growing up, just like find what your dream is and make a plan, go after it. And uh, in general, that's kind of just how I've gone through life too. Describe how you were raised, Stephen. I'm curious. I know your your uh, your father worked in the police department and your mom was uh, at, at a bank maybe. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So my mom worked for my grandfather for most of my childhood. He ran an auction hall. So that was fun. And as a kid, I'd go and help out with that and stuff too, which is like super fun to like, walk around and give people water or something. I don't even remember what I did. But like growing up, like, you know, I have an amazing family. I have two sisters, one that's older, and I have a twin sister. Um, you know, my mom and dad born and raised in Worcester, Massachusetts on a lake. So I had this like, you know, I was just kind of blessed to be on a lake fishing with my dad at 5 a.m., going on a little boat ride mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, in general, life was just calm, <laughs> kind of. Were, were they engaging you in all these activities? Were they pushing you to do science experience? What, what were some of like the the activities that, that you all would do or the, or the rhythms that you had as a family? As a family, they never really pushed me to do anything. They kind of just wanted me to do what I wanted to do. And, you know, they loved that I was pursuing gymnastics and they loved that I was good at it. And they never told me like any expectations in the sport. They always said like, you know, we're proud of you no matter what. We just want you to enjoy what you're doing and see where it goes. And like the same thing goes for like, uh, you know, uh, education. Like my parents were always, you know, if you get a C, that's a bad thing. Like no C's in the household. Um, but like they would always like gift us if we got straight A's. So like if I got straight A's for like the full year of school, which is unreal, you know, I did it like one time, they gave me a hundred bucks and that was like so much money to me. 
And, um, you know, that was just the type of parents I had. They, they kind of like wanted to give me my space and allow me to sort of go after the dreams that I had on my own without putting any extra pressure on me. Would you describe which is more accurate? Your, your household was like pretty rigid and disciplined and structured, or was it more trusting and individualistic maybe? I think a little bit of both. I think growing up, my household was very discipline, disciplinary. Um, like, you know, especially for a kid that had ADHD, I was kind of just bouncing off the walls, not only in, in the house, but like at school and stuff. So like, you know, I went to a pretty strict, like, uh, um, uh, what's it called? Elementary school. I went to a pretty strict elementary school. And, um, you know, I think that going to like a stricter elementary school itself kind of helped shape me into someone that puts my self into someone else's perspective. I think like when that aspect of me is like a little kid awoken, like I was able to be like, oh crap, like I am bouncing off the walls and I kind of gained this ability to self-reflect on all the actions that I was doing and how that affects other people, you know? <laughs> so I think growing up, I was sort of disciplined. And then like, as I got older and like my parents and I earned each other's trust, like it, it became that household where we could just trust each other. What what type of high school did you go to? It was a, it was a technical high school, and and that's where you started your electromechanical engineer. I've never heard of any experience like that. Yeah, so I mean, it's amazing, and I, I'm I'm actually amazed that more people don't go to a technical high school. Uh, so like for me, I could have gone to like the normal high school where my sisters went, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go to a technical high school where I could choose one of I think 26 trades that were at the school. It's just a trade school. Um, and I decided to go into the one that would set me up best for engineering, which happened to be uh, robotics and automation technology. Shout out to Wister Tech. I love you guys. I, I try to visit them as much as I can. Um, and I think that it just set me up so well going into college because I had, you know, one week where I would just focus on my trade. And then I'd have an, the next week where I would just focus on academics like any other normal student. But like I had this like really rich sort of experience being able to build with my hands code and like make circuitry. And like I covered so many, so much stuff over a four year period in high school. Like I could have gone straight to like a state job and, and worked for like, you know, uh, traffic lights, like setting those things up with PLCs, ladder logic. And like, um, it's really cool to have that experience as a high schooler. Someone who's 13 years old can start looking at what electrical engineers begin at. And it's just like such a blessing that I was able to go to that school and it fed me straight into college. Uh, and I had like so much better background on like binary and code than all these other engineering students. So it totally gave me like this like advantage for college. Mm. It's, it's such a beautifully redemptive paradox where here you have this impairment of your vision, but it seems like you're 25 26. <laughs> okay. It's, it seems like you have such a sharp, clear vision for your life. And it's like, it is, <laughs> it's amazing, dude. I feel like it's so rare and kudos to you. I don't know if they're oh, correlated you. at all, or if you would say like your experience and all these hurdles you've had to, to jump has sparked that, um, approach that you have to life or not, but it's, it's impressive. <laughs> Thank you very much. I do think that like facing things in general and like you know, overcoming has been like a common theme in my life. And I think that because of that, like, I just go after goals way harder than other people or something. Cause like, when I have a goal in mind, it's pretty much the only thing I think about every day. Hmm. I also think it's interesting. You started off this interview talking about men's gymnastics and how rare it is and how hard it is to find opportunities as a specialist from a young age. When it seems like every aspect of your life, has actually been very specialized from <laughs> such a young age that it's actually led you to have a lot more opportunity than the average person who would have gone and done every, you know, apparatus in men's gymnastics and gone to a normal high school. Like your your specialty is actually what has made you so incredibly successful. And it's, mm. I think, a very inspirational story for a lot of people to listen to. Well, thank you very much. I did do all the events though throughout high school and then I became a specialist, but yeah, no, my life has been a very interesting journey <laughs> to say the least. And, you know, I think that a lot of the things that I've had happen, like a technical high school, it, it's almost kind of lucky that it worked out as well as it did a lot of things in my life. <laughs>
Have you heard of the book David and Goliath by Malcolm Gladwell? No, I haven't actually. It's interesting. Uh, this conversation just sparked. It's like, you know, uh, it's about the the story of David and Goliath and how people are like, oh, the little guy took out the big giant. But then he kind of dissects it. He's like, no, he actually used his seemingly weakness that he had to and transform that into a strength to actually work smarter instead of doing it through the traditional way. And it kind of resonates with your story, I think. Um, oh, I love that. But how was it being a Nittany, Nittany Lion? <laughs> Love Penn State. Hell, I mean, heck, I loved it so much. <laughs> I, I loved it so much that I stayed an extra two and a half years. I mean, Penn State, getting there as, uh, I wasn't the best gymnast in high school. I didn't get a single recruiting trip, which is like typical of like an athlete. They fly you out. They show you the university. I didn't get a single one of those. So me and my mom, uh, we took a road trip. We visited Penn State, Ohio State, and Illinois, uni or University of Illinois. And um, I chose Penn State because it was just, it seemed like it was the best university for gymnastics. And my club coach told me, like, if you're going to be a Palmer specialist, go to Penn State. So I, I went to Penn State and I immediately was like, oh crap, like these guys are insane at gymnastics. Like I came from a small club gym up in Massachusetts and then to like walk into a collegiate university and see, you know, the fantastic gymnastics that is collected from around the nation in this one gym. I was like, you know, blown away. And like immediately I was like planning on doing more than just pommel horse. But then I was like, I have to at least be the best pommel horse guy in this gym, like first. So that was, that was kind of like walking in. That's like my experience. And I just loved it so much that even after I graduated, I stuck around because I resonated with the coaching staff so well. And then even like the team, like the guys that were below me, I loved all the guys so much. They were like still a team to me even after I graduated. Um, so I stayed around for two and a half years and then finally left and you know, I still visit Penn State as much as I can. Well, wait, what do you mean? You stayed an extra two and a half years? Yeah, I did. So I graduated in 2020 and I stayed until the end of 2022. Just living in Happy Valley? Yep, just living in Happy Valley, living okay. paycheck to paycheck, <laughs> scraping whatever I could together to continue doing the sport I love. What were you doing for work? Um, straight up, I was just on the senior national team. So I was wow. making basically the exact amount of money to survive. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's wild. I, uh, I'm, I'm part, obviously Penn state is crushing in football right now. And my yeah, they, the uh, coach they I played great. for, and yeah, I know it's really fun to watch the coach I played for in, in college is now at Penn state. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty oh, partial sweet. To, to their success. And Sean has <laughs> you have partial Nittany lion background then. Yeah. And uh, did you ever go to Woodward growing up, up there in the... Uh, actually, I didn't go to Woodward. Um, yeah. I I knew that it was a massive camp that happened in Pennsylvania every year. And even when yeah. I was at Penn State and stuff, they never invited me to like coach or anything. So like I've never been to Woodward. <laughs> wow. Interesting. Sean went for years. Many years. Yeah. I did a year. Yeah. At Penn I mean, State it's like too, the biggest... Virtually, but... Yeah. It's like the she biggest camp in the country. Yeah. Yeah. You're Ninny Lion? I am. We are. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Penn State, baby. <laughs> what? That's I did. I did a year virtually. So that counts. I don't know. That if totally I didn't counts. You're one of us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I adore Penn State. It's interesting. It's got to be one of the only sports where the men, the men side of things, gets less resources and attention than the, than the women's well if pommel horse guy comes back for 28 let's go <laughs> i'd say it's pretty equal oh, man. that's crazy. are you going to run for 28 a hundred percent like that has always been the goal i literally said it before like 2024 i was like no matter what happens going into 2024 like i'm going for 2028 it's just i love the sport too much to let it go <laughs> I'm curious what your motivators are. You mentioned you like solving a puzzle. Are you like, are you driven by the financial side of things? Do you like the attention side of things or, or what, like what keeps you striving? I think it, it, it's not financial at all. Like, in fact, I didn't expect to really make any money off of gymnastics. I, I think it's more of just like a pride thing. It's like, I put so much time and effort into this thing that I find to be a beautiful sport. Um, and it doesn't feel like I've done the best I can yet. And I, I want to get to the point where like, I finally do something and I'm like, that was it. That was the moment where that was the best I could do. 
and I can't get any better. But like, I still find myself getting better and better every day in the gym. So it's like, I don't know when the journey will end, but as long as I'm getting better and still enjoying the sport and my body can handle it, I'm going to continue. <laughs> 100% going to continue. I want to bridge the gap for our listeners real quick. So if you could humor this question, um, can you explain why in the United States we take a pommel horse specialist on yeah, our men's course. team to the Olympics? Yeah, so um, it was definitely a risky sort of decision. Not risky, but like um, different. It, it was a different um, path that USA Gymnastics has ever taken. And the way that they selected the team was we took all the competitors from USA Championships and all the competitors from USA Olympic Trials, and we took all of their scores and kind of built up this algorithm where it would select five people teams and figure out what the best scoring teams were. Um, so that is like essentially how they selected the team, but like the one criteria that they put in that actually locked my spot on the Olympic team was that if you took, you know, the four score average, so that's four competitions that we did. And if we average what the score was and then find the best team, like I was the first team that came up and then they did that same sort of thing with the top three scores that you got throughout those competitions and found what the best team was. So this one criteria they had is that if the three score average and the four score average Olympic team was the same through that algorithm, it was the locked team. And that's how it worked out for me. And I think it was probably the only way I could have made that Olympic team. Wow. Wow. Well, it paid off. <laughs> what, what are you most proud of, Steven? Uh, I think the thing that, I find myself so surprised and proud of is that this year I hit nine routines in a row, which is for me unprecedented, um, especially in a sport where I'm kind of pushing the difficulty to like, you know, it's kind of like a routine that's, it, you know, top in the world difficulty wise. Um, and then to hit that nine competitions in a row, like I, I fell one time at winter cup this year and I thought it was going to cost me my spot on national team. And luckily for me, USAG, they, they said, we think you're good enough to go out there and get, you know, international medals. So we're going to put you on the team. Um, and I went to Baku World Cup. I hit those routines. I won the Baku World Cup on pommel horse. And from there on, I haven't missed a routine. <laughs> and I think that just looking at that, and especially with my history of the sport, because pommel horse is such an unstable event, and I've fallen so many times in the past, to like kind of look at this year and, and say, oh my gosh, I hit nine in a row. Like that is pretty unreal, and I'm I'm more than anything impressed with that about myself. Uh, so you mentioned your first debut with the uh, Olympic team or the national team did not go well. Is that right? Yeah, no. Uh, back in 2019, it was kind of a train wreck. I think anyone's first international meet typically is. <laughs> yes. The, what what yes. happened? Uh, okay, yeah. So it was in uh, Doha. Um, and I was super nervous. I actually qualified to the event final. Um, I, I kind of did like a scrappy routine and was like in the eighth position to qualify, I think to that like event final. And I was like, oh my God, like maybe I am good at this on an international scale. Cause I actually had no idea where I'd land. Cause it's one thing to be judged in the USA. And then it's a whole different field to be judged internationally when you're going against world champions and, and people that have all this international experience. Um, so like being able to make an event final was a big deal. But then I could not handle the pressure. And it took me um, a few uh, World Cups internationally to be able to figure out how to handle international pressure. But I ended how up you... falling and I tried to take it with like a smile, but like I was so disappointed in myself. How do you handle it now? Honestly, I think that like because I just have experience in that environment that I've acclimated. And, and that's kind of like a, a recurring theme in my gymnastics career is that it typically takes me like three competitions in an environment to be able to do well. It's like NCAA, my first competition, I really messed up. And then the second competition, I messed up bad. And then the third one, I beat the last year's like reigning NCAA champion on pommel horse. And, um, you know, it was the same thing with like going to like Winter Cup in USA's, like the like um, USA championship events. It took me uh, three tries to be able to do well enough to make like the national team and it is funny. And then like the international stuff, it took me three competitions to be able to do well internationally. 
Um, luckily for me, it only took one Olympics to do well, but <laughs> you know, I think that is kind of like a fun recurring theme. I think that's a, a beautiful perspective too. And it kind of takes the, it kind of takes the pressure off when you have, Hey, this, this might take me a little bit to warm up too. But when that, when your debut on the national team didn't go well, how do you respond to that? Uh, how do you respond to that when, when things don't go well? I mean, I think I even made like an Instagram post about like it. And I, I like, I'm pretty uh, self-reflecting in like my Instagram posts, especially like gymnastics competitions. Like I was definitely, you know, disappointed in myself, but at the same time, like I try to find the positive, like making my first event final was such a big deal. And I could immediately say I was top eight at a world cup. And, and that's an amazing accomplishment in itself. Um, but I think more than anything, whenever you do something and it doesn't go your way, look for like the positives that went along with it. Maybe it's, it was just the journey or maybe it was just like having the courage to face it and like go after it. Um, but I think so long as you don't let it like actually hurt you, like, I, like after that competition, I didn't, I wasn't like scared to go to another competition. In fact, like I, I was like, I want to go to another one and do better. And I think that's like something about me is like, if I mess up, I don't want to like shy away from it and never do it again. Like I want to go back and do it again. Cause like, I know I can do it better. Wow. That's really good. <laughs> I just want to say also before the next question, can I just thank you as now a mom now <laughs> that I just, I want our kids to like listen to this. Yeah. Every <laughs> so piece of advice that you have, your humility, your drive, your passion, your ability to like, find humor and light and joy. It's just, I'm like, yeah, we're just going to sit our kids down and make sure they watch this. <laughs> um, oh, I really appreciate that. Our son had his first competition, not in gymnastics and BMX of all things. I don't know how our oh, three was in BMX. Wait, he you had said his first he's competition. He's, he's three. three. Three and he's doing BMX? <laughs> Wait, that's yeah. so cool. He's what an animal. I, yeah. We had someone ask us, <clears throat> like, did you push this on him? I'm like, trust me, this is not the thing we would have chosen as yeah. parents. If this is, um, so it's truly his thing. But he had his first competition last week. And as a three year old, he's already, we're trying to figure out how to, like, how do you, how do you foster, like, healthy competition in a kid? But it was, he, like, crossed his finish line. He got third. And I don't think he even understood what was happening, obviously. But he saw, <clears throat> the first place kid get a trophy and he's like well where's my trophy and we were like oh. oh baby you didn't get a trophy you know you came <laughs> third but if you cross the finish line first next time you can get a trophy and he's like oh okay let's go again yeah oh, and that's like it the was... perfect mindset i've ever heard yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he's and already we there like, he's got 20 uh -oh. years of experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we were really shocked by it so his next one's this weekend we'll see um oh, but moving luck. forward <laughs> uh in Dancing with the Stars, you are nearing the end. Um, myself and my daughter have actually been out there, and we watched you, and we were, I was so excited for you. You're so good. Dude, <laughs> you're you. so good. She's so smooth. I don't know how else to describe it's it. You're so just, like, good. cruising out there, dude. I am not going <laughs> to lie when I say, like, there has not been a male gymnast on the show. So you just never know. Like you said, you had never danced before. I was like, I don't know what to expect. This is the premiere. And when you went out there... Holy crap, Steven, you're so good. <laughs> Anyways, as you near the end, what are your goals now finishing out the season of Dancing with the Stars? Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you so much. for you know, it, it feels so good to hear that because dance is such like an intimidating thing. <laughs> and like it, it's a vulnerable thing. And, you know, it, it feels nice to be able to hear that you guys enjoy watching me dance. Um, but my goal has been very constant throughout this journey. And it's just... To like fall in love with it and to get as good as I can. And luckily for me, I have an amazing partner. And like me and Riley, we just like resonate with one another, just like on like a personality level, not even just like a coach and student level. Like I think like I just have a fantastic coach who's made this journey so fun and exciting. Um, and, and my goal is just to get as good as I can and go out there and whatever happens, happens. I'm not too worried about winning. I'd love to win, but it, you know, even in gymnastics, it's never my goal to win. I think that that's sort of a byproduct of the work you put into it. Mm. I love that. Well, we'll be voting. Are you <laughs> concurrently, are you still training for gymnastics while you're out there? Um, actually, I'm not. And this is the longest gymnastics break I've 
ever taken in my life. And I'm a little scared about my comeback into the sport, but you know, a few weeks ago we had a pommel horse is like the dance is part of the mm-hmm. dancer team. And I got like a solid 30 minutes where like, you know, no one was looking and I was like playing around and doing some actual gymnastics on it. And I kind of still got some moves. So like, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be the worst comeback, especially with how much like in shape dance keeps you. Like, mm-hmm. I think yeah. that when I finally do get to come back to gymnastics, it'll, it'll be able to be picked up easily again. <laughs> are, are you, are you big into fitness and nutrition? Uh, not really. Uh, in fact, if, if a nutritionist saw what I ate, they'd probably be like, Oh God, <laughs> what, what are you eating these days? I'm curious. Uh, All right. So this is funny and it, it comes with uh, certain statistics behind it too. But, um, every single night I have a, a heaping bowl of ice cream that's around 700 wow. calories. And it is important for me to have that because I generally don't have a huge appetite. Like I eat my three meals a day, but like I, I don't eat like a big meal. Like I eat until like, I feel like I've eaten enough. I don't eat until like I'm stuffed full. Um, so like, I don't get enough calories throughout my day. And like last year at like national team camp, they did some like blood work and everything was really good for me, except for my bone density. They're like, Hey, like your bone density is just like a little bad. And like, we need to make sure that like you're eating enough calories so that your bone density isn't taking this sort of toll. So I was like, okay. And I was like, how do I do that? And they like, gave me healthy snacks and I tried it and I was like, I can't eat that much food. <laughs> like, I can't eat yeah. that much healthy food. So I settled for ice cream and, um, every single competition that I've brought like junk food to, like whether that's cookies or ice cream, I've done well. And every yeah. competition in the past year that I didn't bring it to, I did bad. So even at the yeah. Olympics, I made sure to bring my, uh, my, uh, Girl Scout cookie tag alongs. Uh, mm. to, I brought like a ton of them to the Olympics and I remember it was literally like I had to like ration them out to make sure that the night before competitions, I was able to have my tag alongs <laughs> wow. and I'd make sure to have like my 700 calorie snack and it worked out beautifully for me. <laughs> How many tag alongs are we, we talking? Are we talking like a whole sleeve? Are we talking like two or three? So if I remember correctly, um, I think it was every two cookies of a tag along was like 200 calories or something. It, okay. They're calorie dense food. Yeah. <laughs> so I would just eat like six of them and yeah. hit like my, my, or like uh, six to eight of them or something and hit like wow. the mark I was going for. And I was like, okay, when I wake up tomorrow, I'm going to have the sugar in my system and I'll be ready to go for the day. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And then your, your fitness routine, are you like into lifting weights or are you pretty much gymnastics exclusive? Yes. Yeah, so this is one of my like hot takes as a gymnast um, that, you know, I think that like weightlifting itself is very important when it comes to like, sh- like, uh, like joint mobility and like re- rehab. Um, I think that if you're doing like, uh, weightlifting for like muscle growth itself in the sport of gymnastics, I think that kind of like offsets your body's equilibrium, um, in a sport that's completely calisthenic. My personal belief is that like the strength or like the muscle growing things that you do should be calisthenic exercises. So whenever I do any weightlifting, it's, it's not a lot of weight and it's strictly just for like strengthening my shoulders or my wrists or, you know, my back, you know, just generally things like that. I I, I think that's smart. Uh, (laughs) I like it. I, I want to revisit. So the tag along thing, really good insight. Is there anything else that people don't know about your experience at the, at the Olympics? Uh, I mean, I was pretty much just like. I, I was so boring at the Olympics that like people don't know that like I didn't do anything like there's like this entire Olympic village and you know we're on this one corner over here and it goes all the way up to over here and I pretty much just stuck in this corner the whole time I didn't do oops I didn't do like any adventuring or anything fun I was so locked in on the mission that we had ahead of us that like I didn't really allow myself to explore Paris whatsoever <laughs> I'm curious so Sean and I look up to you. We want our kids to look up to you. Who do you look up to? Yeah, this is a crazy one too. Growing up, I didn't watch sports at all. And like, I didn't even like watch gymnastics. Like I enjoyed doing the sport so much, but I never really had a role model in it whatsoever. And like, it didn't, it it took until maybe like, um, kind of like college when I started to like think about who it is I look up to and like, the conclusion that like I really got to is like the people I look up to are my competitors. And like, I look up to the people that I'm worried about, you know, the people that I'm worried can beat me. 
And uh, I think like in general, that's just what keeps me motivated in the sport is like, I want to be the best in the world. And right now I'm looking at this dude who's a little better than me. So I'm going to keep chasing him until I'm better. Mm. Wow. That's great. Do we get to meet Tess? Is she around or no? <laughs> yeah. Here, Tess. <laughs> they want to say hi. Oh, and, and we got to meet Kuju too. You want to meet Kuju too? Let's get him. Come here, buddy. Grab the cat. Here's an AirPod. Dub it in. in the AirPod. Uh, All right, here comes Tess and the cat. Oh, the whole squad here. <laughs> Tess, squad. hello. Hey, oh, hey. oh my god. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so good to meet you. Great to meet you. I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Here's Kuju. Here's Kuju. Hey. Hi. Let's great I'll to meet him. you guys. And you competed at Penn State as well. Yes, I did. Amazing. Dang. I said, I can't really call myself a Nittany Lion, but I did one year virtual at Penn State, and I She's adore a Penn State. Lion. That's enough. That's enough. That's a, that's a, that's a, I, I think I said the exact it counts. same thing. It counts. That's enough. <laughs> Welcome to the family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we absolutely adore you guys. Adore you guys. Yeah. And our voting and our cheering and our your guys' is like best cheerleaders. Yeah. <laughs> best fans. I know you're not trying, you know, your your focus isn't on winning, but we would love to see bring it home, yeah. Steven. I'll bring try it my home. Hardest. I'll try my absolute hardest yeah. to bring it home. <laughs> love it. Thanks so much for the time, Tess. Sorry to rope you oh. into this, but it was great yeah. to meet you. No, you're good. I completely forgot. Like I knew I saw the name of the podcast and like, you know, this is his thing that he works with. So I was like, yeah, okay, cool. I was not expecting to come in. <laughs> Oh. Well, it's great to see you again. You guys have a great Friday, all right? Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. This was an absolute blast, and thanks for cheering me up. And good yeah. luck to thank the BMX guys. competition this weekend. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs>